If you were coming here today to talk about effective vendor risk management, you're in the right room. If you're not, um, if that wasn't what you were looking for, this isn't the right room, but you might learn something anyways. Hopefully, we'll, we'll, we'll go ahead and we'll see. Um, a little bit of uh, business. So I do appreciate uh, if you have a question, I'm perfectly okay with you uh, interrupting the presentation with your question. Um, I think it's a lot easier to do it while we're still in context. Uh, but you'd have to work with Chris on that. Uh, you're gonna have to come up to the microphone and he'll have to unmute you and so forth. So I'll let you guys work it on that end. But if I hear a voice come through, I'm gonna stop my presentation. So, okay, with that, let's go ahead and get started. Um, I, I added a slide here, just a little bit about myself. I don't wanna take time to cover all of this. The bottom line here is that, you know, I've been doing security for an awfully long time. Um, and uh, I'm currently the vice president of information security at CareCentrix one of the many health companies you never hear about, we work for the payers, so the big insurance companies. Um, personally, that's more, I'd love to talk more about that. So I'm a father of six, grandfather of three. I love the outdoors. Uh, I am a former ethical hacker who has traded in the command line for sending emails and going to meetings. So that's what you have to look forward to if you move along the management track on information security. Talk to me more if you wanna, if you wanna hear anything about that, that progression uh, in my life. I'm, I'm happy to have conversations about that. So what are we gonna talk about today? Well, I wanna spend time talking about effective vendor risk management. Why am I qualified to talk about this? Because I'm on both sides of vendor risk management. So as a uh, service provider to large insurance companies, I receive a ton of vendor risk management activities and then also as the head of security for a huge healthcare organization, um, I also do a lot of vendor risk management. So I've seen a lot of good and I've seen an awful lot of bad. Uh, so my goal today is to share that with, uh, with, with you, uh, the audience, and kind of share my experiences and what I've come to see uh, to be effective risk management practices. Let's start a little bit and talk about just vendor risk management in general, right? What do most companies do? Well, they just sit down, they make a list of their vendors, they're gonna send out a few questionnaires. They might rate those vendors by risk, but it rarely extends beyond just documenting things. So this kind of vendor risk management program is a paper tiger. It doesn't really result in any effective uh, increase in security with that vendor relationship. And we all know, like I'm sure the buzzwords, uh, Casera and uh, SolarWinds, I'm sure we've heard we will hear about this all through the conference this week, over and over and over again. I don't really need to emphasize how important vendor risk management is, um, but I do just want to point out that moving the lever a little bit, uh, is the fulcrum a little bit, is really going to help bring your vendor risk management program to be something that's more proactive and that's more effective. So what is effective vendor risk management? Well, um, if my clicker will work, there we go. You do the same tasks, you enumerate all your vendors, but you assign a business owner to each of those vendor engagements. You also assess all of your vendors um, in context with what they do. You're gonna rate and stack rank your vendors and you're gonna work to find out, essentially you're working to find out what risks do my vendors really have and then what appetite do they have to remediate those risks and then the bit working with the business relationship owner to ensure that that happens. This kind of effective program is characterized by being proactive in both your assessment as well as risk remediation, but also collaborative. So in a really good vendor relationship, I'm on a first name basis with the, the security head or even the CTO or CEO of that organization, and we have shared goals our shared goals to ensure that this relationship that we have has a significant reduction in risk over time. That's what effective vendor risk relationship is. So I guess with that, you could all leave if you wanted to. But what we're gonna talk about today is a little bit more around how. And of course, the first step here is the questionnaire process. And we all, I mean, I'm in the middle of doing two questionnaires right now uh, that are about 250 questions long. My team's been working on those for several days now. We, we all encounter that, that questionnaire process, right? So what is it? Um, it's, it's ubiquitous. There are a lot of challenges and, and there are challenges on both sides, right? How long is it? How much time is it gonna be invested in responding? 
we got to ask ourselves, where are the questions going to come from? How is it managed? How do we deliver it, complete it, and so forth? And what do we do about the answers, especially when the answers are non-compliant? Really, folks, this is the heart of what we want to talk about today. Not the questionnaire itself, but the process of gathering that information and using it to assess risk. So it's, it's like a necessary evil, if you will, um, but it's something that we need to look at for sure. When, we, when I go to create questions um, for my clients, I have all sorts of sources for those questions, right? So there's a series of industry standards I can pull questions from. Um, I use some industry partners in the healthcare uh, side of things. I use High Trust. Coral is another company that I use. There are the SIGs and shared assessments. Uh, if you're working in application security, you can pull some questions from some of the BSIM uh, capability model, so forth. There's, there's a lot of places to get them. One place to keep in mind for your questions is going to be your customers. Remember, we're bringing a vendor in, and in most cases, that vendor is going to act either on, on our behalf and do something for us, like an HR vendor who's going to help us with, I don't know, time management or payroll or so forth or they're coming in to help us provide services to our customers. And in that case, many customers are providing contractual obligations to me that I have to extend on uh, to my vendors. So I get a lot of my questions from my customers. I also get a lot of questions from industry compliance obligations. So being in healthcare, HIPAA regulation uh, forces me to ensure uh, certain things are being performed by my vendors. And then finally, if I'm working in a cloud atmosphere, a cloud environment, a shared responsibility model also drives some of those questions. So lots of different sources for the questions that we're going to use to assess the security of our vendors. One thing that comes up quite often is the security scorecard, bit site uh, thing. You know, are, is that a good source for questions and is that a good source for risk management? I wish I were there in the audience today because after this presentation, I would want to have a long conversation uh, about these organizations. So they purport to do the work for you. They basically say, pay us some money, we're going to assess your vendors, just give us their name. I find that they have accuracy issues. Half the time they don't even find the applications that I'm using for a given contract. Half the time they do, and, and, or they find an application, but it's like my WordPress-based corporate site and it has no sensitive information on it whatsoever. I also think they kind of hold us in a hostage situation. We don't choose to do business with them, but we're forced to. Finally, as a holder of a CISSP and several GX certifications, I have signed uh, an agreement that, that in ethics uh, code that says I will not scan someone without their permission. And I find that this really crosses, it comes close to that line of scanning without permission. So not a big fan of these. I would love to have a deeper conversation, especially if there's someone here who really advocates for this. I'd, I'd love to hear more about it. But for me, I, I'm, I'm not in favor of them. And I don't really like to use them um, to assess my vendors. So move on. Uh, oh, OK. So we're going we're gonna to cover a case study. Before I jump into the case study, I just want to say I'm going to be using a tool called Simple Risk GRC. I'm, this isn't a NASCAR race. I'm not advocating for anything. You can do in Excel or in Google Docs what I'm going to do with Simple Risk. I love it because it's quick, it's easy to use, um, it is well organized, and it really supports the workflow that I'm trying to implement. Um, and it's actually very affordable, and I find it, above all things, it's very agile. Um, I can get it stood up in an organization and working and actually providing value within a couple of weeks. So I'm a fan of Simple Risk. That doesn't mean you have to use simple risk for what we're, gonna, what we're going to cover today. But we're going to spend probably the next 20 minutes or so in simple risk talking about vendors, how you would manage a vendor. We're going to talk about those questionnaires. Where, are, where do I get my questions? How do I get a questionnaire out? How do I bring it back? And then we'll talk about scoring and actually identifying risk uh, with those vendors as we score it. So uh, I'm just going to take a second here. I'm going to stop the video. Uh, and we're going to do a few other things, so just stand by while we get there. Okay, so on screen here is the UI for Simple Risk. And hopefully it's legible. I use a large monitor. I did have Chris take a look at it, um, and he, he felt it was visible. But if not, please come up to the microphone and, and let me know if it's not visible to you all. 
So a quick, quick tour of Simple Risk. It has the very common GRC components that you would expect, governance, risk management, compliance, um, asset management, and then some assessments and reporting, and finally, configuration, a very, very typical uh, solution that you might use. What I like about Simple Risk is it allows me to coordinate between these different functions so I can share data across the functions. Um, I also like it because it, it, it's very flexible and allows me to implement a program the way I want to implement a program. So we won't do much here on the governance tab, but just keep in mind that on a government, in governance, it, we all have kind of the same approach, right? We have a common set of controls. Maybe it's 200, 250. Smaller organizations might only have 100 or so. We have a set of controls, and generally those controls map to numerous frameworks. I'm often asked by individuals, you know, what do you know about PCI? Or what do you know about HIPAA? Or what do you know about, uh, you know, this, that, or the other framework? The, the key is that most frameworks have a 90% overlap. And really what we care about is the controls and how they're implemented. Um, and so as you see here, we've got a series of controls. These controls are sourced from the Compliance Forge framework, um, but they're common controls that we would use everywhere. Uh, I like the fact that I can tie all of my questions to a control. One of the things that happens to me when I'm managing vendor relationships, uh, my business will come to me and complain on behalf of my vendor that I'm asking too many questions. Uh, it sort of surprises me that that happens, but it does. So by being able to tie my questions to controls, I'm able to demonstrate to my, uh, my business team, hey, all of these questions are driven either by compliance HIPAA or high trust, or they're driven by contractual compliance by our customers. And I, I actually create a framework for every customer and the specific requirements that they give me. I'll map that to uh, various controls. So having a GRC solution is really helpful for doing that mapping and having data ready for when people come and ask really kind of crazy questions. Risk management, we're going to spend a lot of time in risk management uh, throughout this demo. But basically, it's, it's a list of risks. And uh, we can talk about mitigations and how we're going to handle those risks. We're going to focus on risks associated with our vendors. Um, but you know, for instance, in my organization, I have risks from all over. I, I bring in risks from vulnerability management. I bring in risks from application security, risks from my vendor management, and so forth. So they're all kind of here in my list of risks. Um, compliance is where I can initiate an audit. We won't be using the compliance tab today. Asset management is a tab that I do use often with vendor management. So we're going to take a quick look here at the edit assets. You'll see I have a list of assets in here. One thing that I do, um, I, so Simple Risk doesn't have a built-in concept of different asset types. It's just assets. So um, in my implementation of Simple Risk, I always precede my assets with some sort of moniker. So app for an application. And you'll see down here, V stands for vendor. That's how I'm able to split my assets up a little bit and, and am able to track them more easily in the system. So we'll use each vendor will be a specific asset. And we'll be able to track risks associated with that asset. That will allow us to um, streamline our reporting. Where we want to spend most of our time today is in the assessments tab. We're going to be talking about different assessments. We're going to show how to create an assessment. Um, and we'll use those assessments to gather answers, to rank risks, and talk a little bit more about um, how we might prioritize risks for one vendor over another. Um, so uh, let's start with the questionnaire questions portion of this tab. One of the things that Simple Risk provides is a bank of questions. Uh, and you can pull these questions into various questionnaires, and you don't have to keep rewriting them. You're also able to tie your risks to the questions. These questions are also, in many cases, mapped to a specific compliance framework, or at least a control. So we start with a bank of questions. Uh, by default, uh, my simple risk entry came with 640 questions. I added four for the purpose of this demonstration. So as you can tell, I worked really hard to get ready. Next concept is the idea of a questionnaire template. So a questionnaire template is exactly that. It's a, it's, if you're an object-oriented coder, it is the object that you instantiate to deliver a series of questions to your client. You'll see up at the top here, I created one called Application Quick Risk Assessment. So let's take a quick look at, at that. Um, 
you'll see when it opens here that currently I have four questions in it. Um, so I've created this as a demonstration for how I do a quick assessment across my organization of applications. Um, ours is a little bit longer than this, but this is here for demonstration purposes only. So I'll ask what data the application process is, whether it's in scope, um, whether it's a cloud-based, and how many records are in it. Very simple approach. Um, very easy to get those answers from the organization. So we're going to work here in the questionnaire section. You'll see that there is a, uh, a series of questionnaires. We've got three of them. So a questionnaire is an instance of a questionnaire template that was responded to by a given organization. So in this case, you'll see there's a vendor cloud HR summary CSF questionnaire 2021. This is the one that we want to look at a little bit. Um, so we'll go in and we'll edit this. So this is a questionnaire that I created that I sent to a company, to my, my vendor, v-cloudhr. And there's something interesting here that we're going to talk about further on in this conversation. There is an owner associated with this, with this questionnaire and with this vendor. That owner is not part of the security team. And that's a cultural thing that we need to take care of. We'll talk more about it after this, after this demonstration. But it's very important that the relationship owner is a member of the business, specifically whoever uh, brought up the request to have that relationship. Um, so for up to menu, I can send out my questionnaires. All, not all that interesting. What's more interesting is getting the results of those questionnaires. So we're going to take a look here at the summary CSF questionnaire for um, uh, and this is not this has not been completed, but you'll see here I created a critical security controls questionnaire. So summary CSF. There are um, I believe about uh, 20 odd controls. Yeah, there's exactly 20. So this is a summary of the common security framework, the NIST CSF. This is a summary set of questions for the NIST CSF, and a great starting point for assessing your vendors, provided you don't have any additional. Um, uh, uh, compliance requirements such as HIPAA or PCI or so, so forth. Um, and you'll see that this questionnaire wasn't filled out. So we'll go back and take a look at one that has been completed. Um, so uh, I completed this one as part of the demonstration yesterday. You'll see here that the responses are captured. So we've got yes and no answers throughout the questionnaire. That's how it's been set up. What's really important here is at the very top, there is a risk assessment. The risk assessment goes and it it calculates the risk score for the responses for that given questionnaire. You'll see that we have some pending risks. Uh, we have a few uh, active risks and then uh, no closed risks. Actually, maybe there are a couple, but let's dig in here. So a pending risk is simply when the, uh, when the recipient has answered a question in such a manner that it looks like it's a risk. It may not necessarily be a risk, so it needs to be reviewed by the security team to evaluate it. So in this case, the subject here is that um, attackers can uh, find and exfiltrate information. So the risk is a, a data loss risk. It's created by asking the question, uh, whoops, come on. I apologize. It's kind of clicking on me. It was created by, ask, by the uh, answer to the question, do you have processes and tools to track or prevent secure access to critical resources. So the, the, uh, in this case, the vendor answered no and didn't provide any additional comments. So it's difficult for me to score this question with no context. But in my case, I'm going to take a no here and say, OK, this is definitely a risk. They need to have data, uh, uh, controls against exfiltration and controls to maintain access. They have said they don't. Um, and I'm going to revisit, I'm going to look at this custom value, which is the risk score, and kind of decide between 0 and 10 what I think that is. Let's make it a 7. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to add this risk. Now I've created a new risk associated with this vendor. It's on my risk register, and it's in a state that I can go and manage that risk. So we'll look at one or two more just to kind of do a little muscle memory, and then we're going to go look at how we treat those risks. So. Next one here, attackers can gain wireless access. So there was a question, do you have processes and tools to prevent or correct the secure use of wireless local area networks? Their answer was no. I don't know if that means they don't have any networks or if they do and they just aren't controlling them, but I'm going to assume the worst in this case. 
And I'm going to say, okay, well, you know, with a wireless network, maybe that's 50% of their usage, so I'm going to rate it a 5. And we'll go ahead and add that. Now, we could do this for all of the answers. There's still two more risks that we could go through and do an, uh, uh, an assessment of. I don't want to take your time to do that. It's a little bit redundant. The question is, what comes next? In many companies, they, the, um, you know, the security team or the compliance team will send out these questionnaires. They'll gather back the answers, and then they won't do anything. That doesn't help your security at all. It doesn't help your risk at all. So the question here is, what are we going to do next with those risks? So let's move into the reporting section. We're going to take a look at a dynamic risk report. So this is basically just a, a list of all of the risks, which we can go ahead and filter. So as simple risk loads in those risks, what we're going to do is filter by asset. So we'll take a look at the um, Cloud HR asset and filter down so we can see all of the risks associated with this organization. Looks like there's, there's quite a few. There's six risks here. Um, some of them have uh, higher scores up as high as seven. Uh, and, and I don't really like that level of risk. It doesn't make me comfortable. Um, I want to be sure then that this vendor is going to address the risk. How do I approach that? Well, the first thing that I can do is I can provide information to my business owner on the risk. Um, in the form of, under the mitigation tab, I can identify the requirements and my recommendations. So we're going to go ahead and edit this. So the requirement for this control, attackers can use unauthorized and unmanaged software to collect sensitive information. So a security requirement is that all vendor systems processing sensitive information on behalf of Contesso uh, must... Uh, um, have application whitelisting uh, functioning. So somehow, so they've got to prevent um, unauthorized uh, installation of software. So what is my recommendation here? Uh, you know, uh, deploy a whitelist, an application whitelisting solution. I won't go into details, but you you can sit, you can use this information to share with your business owner so the business owner understands what you're looking for. One of the most important things about being successful in security today is never saying no. If you say no and you don't follow up with an answer of how you're going to get to yes, you will find yourself out of a job very quickly. Companies don't have the patience today that they had 10 years ago. Um, and it's much better to be proactive. So instead of going to Suzanne Nova, who is the, uh, the owner of this risk, the owner of this relationship, and saying, there's a problem with that company, what we're doing here is we're saying, hey, there is a problem, we have a requirement, and here's some recommended uh, approaches to meet that requirement. You're now empowering your business owner. You're telling them, hey, this vendor represents a risk to us. We should not proceed with that risk. However, there are ways to fix it. It seems like a little thing, but it's actually a really big deal to the business, and it helps with that cultural change that we'll talk about more. All right, so now what have we done? We've identified that, well, the, the vendor has self-attested to a risk. We've reviewed that risk and given it a risk rating. We've now given the business relationship owner some ideas on how the vendor can fix that risk. What comes next? This is where I, I was talking about establishing a good relationship with your vendor. What we do is we sit down with a business relationship owner and with a vendor and we review each of their risks. We prepare them ahead of time by giving them a list of risks along with our requirements and our recommendations. We allow them to do some research. Then we literally perform a review. So um, that workflow is semi-automated for us in simple risk. If you're using Excel or something, you just add a new column and you say, you know, review outcome or review notes. So in this review, a couple of things happen. First of all, I approve the risk. What that means is everything that's been documented is accurate and it is a risk. It's a risk that we want to look at and manage in the company. So I approve the risk. The next step, oh, I'm sorry, I'm doing, <laughs> I'm doing this out of sequence. I, I, didn't, I didn't look at my notes. So we're going to cancel what we're doing here because actually what we want to do is we want to plan a mitigation. 
So we will sit down with that vendor and we are going to go through the process of planning and mitigation. So we will ask the vendor what strategy they want to take for that risk. Um, you know, some vendors may say, hey, I just want you to accept it. Well, that's probably not going to fly. So we're going to ask them to maybe come up with a mitigation plan. And then we're going to document their mitigation plan. So um, let's see, uh, HR Cloud um, will implement, I'm sorry for my spelling, application whitelisting in all affected systems uh, by January 30th, 2020. So we have, a, we have a current solution. Their mitigation planning strategy is to mitigate, and their date for mitigation is the end of January. So pretty simple to track, um, and we'll go ahead and save it. Now, now what, what happens is often my security analysts will perform this, this level of detail. They'll be the ones meeting with the business relationship owners and with the vendors. They'll document all of this, and then I will perform the review. So it's my job to decide whether or not I accept this. I'm going to prove the risk and I'm going to say, yep, I accept uh, the current plan until the next review. Um, and then uh, I'm going to go ahead and, and review that risk in the middle of December. I want to make sure the vendor is tracking to resolving the risk. So um, submit the review. That's it. That's pretty simple. Um, we then can follow up with the vendor over time and make sure, okay, you know, they've committed to a mitigation date of uh, the 31st of January of next year. So we can have follow-up conversations. We can track in comments everything that we discuss, and we can, we can make sure that that vendor is on track to resolving that, uh, that risk in a timely manner. What else can I do with this? Well, what's nice, I can go and I can report on those risks. So if I go into the dynamic risk report for me, you might be using Excel, SharePoint, whatever else. I don't really care how you do it. I can choose Suzanne Nova and report out on all of the risks associated with Suzanne. Do they have, when I can expand the columns here. So I can report out on whether or not the risks have been reviewed, whether they have a mitigation plan. Um, I can report whether they're beyond their mitigation date. Um, and I can also report just, you know, what's the highest risk. Other thing I could do is I can do a report uh, for all of our owners. I can sort by affected asset and I can tell you, you know, what the summary score is for each of my vendors. So I can keep track of their overall risk rating. Um, uh, let me stop there and I'm actually going to kind of break protocol and just ask. We've gone through a lot. It's a demo. It's a one-way conversation. You're not even looking at me, but I'm looking at you. Are there any questions? Do you want to come up to the microphone and ask any questions about entering, uh, you know, the questionnaire process, entering risks, tracking them, so forth? I don't know if Chris is even in the room, but if someone is. Very long, awkward pause. <laughs> All right, then I think what we're going to do is we'll return to the presentation. I'm going to pick the video back up. We'll walk through the presentation, and then uh, if there are questions at the end, we can flip back into simple risk um, as needed. So we'll go ahead and we're, we'll get video started again. So we're back on video. Uh, but please, if you do have questions, come on up. Uh, to the front of the room or to wherever the microphone is and ask those questions. So let's talk a little bit more. Once we've got these risks identified, we know what the mitigation plan is and so forth, the next step is to communicate it. Um, I don't know about you, but in my organization early on, the culture was, oh, vendor risk, that the vendor management team takes care of that. Um, and so it's been a, an uphill battle really to overcome that attitude uh, sorry, let me move into presentation mode here so my clicker will work. It's been kind of an uphill battle, and really the question comes down to who owns vendor risk? And in many cases, organizations think that the security team owns it because the security team tracks it and reports on it and seems to be passionate about it. The real answer to that, that question, though, in my opinion, is that there should be a business relationship owner, and yes, we actually do call them a bro, uh, typically, that relationship owner is whoever is in a management level decision making, uh, uh, I'm sorry, a decision making level in management 
who chooses to bring that particular vendor into the company. They are, you can tell who the business relationship owner is because they're the ones most uh, vocally advocating for the need for a solution or at sometimes advocating for that vendor. Um, they fight sometimes strongly to bring a vendor in no matter what the risk is. That's a really good indicator that you found the relationship owner. And they're your ally in addressing and resolving vendor risk. If you can get to the point in your organization where, where your business relationship owner owns the risk, then you've accomplished 50% of your job. And how do you do that? Well, like I demonstrated in Simple Risk, when we create that vendor asset and we start to identify risks associated with that asset, the owner of those risks is the business relationship owner. Nothing wakes someone up as much as being told that they are accountable for the risks that they're introducing to the organization. Um, and yet at the same time, well, you can do that in the wrong way, which is to just say, that's your problem, you're bringing this risk in. The right way to do it is to partner with that individual, empower them and, and help them understand that you are there to help them resolve that risk. But in the end, they own the risk and they own the decision to work with the risk. If you can accomplish that, you'll see an amazing cultural shift in your organization and you'll see an amazing reduction in risk because when the business owner goes to the vendor and says, fix this, that weighs a lot more heavily than when the security uh, team, a security analyst uh, jumps in and does that. So number one factor, I think, in driving your corporate risk down is ensuring that the business recognizes they own the risk and that they are 100% convinced you are their partner in driving that risk down. What you cannot do is give them a report and just say, "Is your risk, good luck, go fix it. You have to be that partner um, and really drive that with, with, the, with the business. Okay, so that's success for vendor risk. So how do we communicate that risk? Well, you know, as in all things security related, there's a four step process. We identify the risk using those questionnaires. We evaluate the risk by scoring and coming up with a treatment plan. We communicate that risk to the vendor and get, in order to get the treatment planning. And finally, we remediate it. All along the way, and here's the next key thing, all along the way, we are reporting on that risk regularly. So every week, every month, whatever rhythm you establish in your organization, a risk, a vendor risk report should be delivered to your business relationship owner, to whatever your internal risk committee is, and to the vendor. You want your audience to understand that you have an eye on this, you are tracking it, you are paying attention to it. If you noticed, the process is really the same that we use for all risk management. Vulnerability management, for instance, we identify vulnerabilities, we evaluate the fix, we communicate the issues, we remediate the vulnerabilities and we report on them. It's a very common process. There's nothing magic about this. It's, it's the persistence and consistency which matter. Um, and that's really a challenge, especially if you are working in a spreadsheet kind of world, it can be a challenge to do that. It's one of the things I love about having a GRC system, whatever you pick it can remind me to do those things and it can automate a lot of the work that I have to do. Um, so communicating that risk is really, really critical. Uh, you know, it's, it's like working with teenagers or even younger, like toddlers. Um, they're constantly pushing boundaries, right? And if you are not consistent and persistent in your parenting style, uh, they, will, they will overrun those boundaries on a regular basis. Um, and it's kind of the same way. We have so many demands on us in business that uh, we will ignore what doesn't come to us repeatedly. Oop. We skipped a few slides here. So um, the next question, effective risk management, who owns risk? We've talked about this a little bit, but really it's important to understand we are experts in risk in the security uh, realm. We should be. Uh, we should be experts at identifying risks assessing those risks, coming up with an appropriate rating and communicating them. We're not necessarily experts in terms of whether or not that risk exceeds the business's risk appetite. Um, if you have a CISO, so if you have a chief officer uh, who leads the security program, in many cases, 
She can act on behalf of the business. She understands that context, provided she's been authorized by your security and risk committee, your audit committee, your board, whoever. Um, they need the appropriate authority. But in many cases, she can be the one who, who uh, will accept risk on behalf of the business. Ultimately, though, the business relationship owner really needs to own that risk. It's important for that. All right, uh, last part of the presentation. We're actually a little bit ahead of schedule, so I think that's probably good. Last part of the presentation, tips for vendors. I have two kinds of vendors that I work with. I have vendors and I have partners. And um, the difference is how much value a vendor brings to the table and how much they demonstrate they care about the constraints I'm working in, and particularly compliance. So we're gonna talk a little bit about that. How are you a partner rather than just a vendor? There's two key things here. You wanna differentiate yourself. And trust me, if you as a vendor are promoting security as a feature or a benefit, and it's not just talk, that differentiates you. You take security seriously. So you're looking for certifications, uh, achieving them and maintaining them. Um, and moreover, you are collaborative with your, uh, with your client or customer partners. I think a really big thing here that we don't like to do in the security industry is to be open, um, to admit gaps. We, we feel like there's a lot of risk in doing that. Um, but the vendors who work with me who admit those gaps and are like, yeah, yeah, you're right. We, you know, we don't have a WAF in place um, and uh, we understand you're concerned about it. We're gonna look into what it's gonna take to put that WAF in in front of our services. That's the kind of vendor that I think is a partner. Finally, it, this may seem silly, but have and practice an incident response plan. In this world today, it is not a case of if you will have an incident, it's when. And the time to learn how to do incident response is not during an incident, it's well in advance. The other thing that you need to understand about us as your customers, for us, security is no longer an option. It is a requirement. Our boards are putting significant pressure on us especially after the Solera and the Kaseya uh, incidents that happened this year, they are very concerned about third-party software, they're concerned about third-party services and third-party vendors. Um, if you open the Verizon data breach investigation reports for the last, I don't know, 10 years, you'll find that a, a overwhelming number of breaches uh, involved a third party. And boards are aware of that now and they're really looking to security leaders to ensure that Third parties are partners, not vendors. Um, keep in mind also that there are risks that we can control within our organization. You know, we can handle our vulnerability management risks. We can handle our AppSec risks. And then there's you. And we can't control you. Uh, and, and, you know, it wouldn't be appropriate for us, for us to do so. But we can certainly look to you to partner with us. You have to keep in mind that when you sell something to us and you sign that contract with us, that is a commitment. So all the security you've done up to date is appreciated and it's anticipated that that will continue. Having a good relationship with your customers really is a team effort. Um, and being a team player is what will help you succeed in the marketplace. Now, that's a lot of investment as a vendor um, and it may not seem to pay off immediately. But uh, as anyone in this room can tell you, there are security vendors that we love to work with, and then there are security vendors that we really don't like to. Their reputations begin to precede them in market. The same thing would happen whether you're providing HR benefit services, uh, medical record examination services, or anything else. Your reputation will precede you in market over time. So the investment you make to be a partner versus a vendor now will certainly pay off down the road. That, um, that really is it in terms of the formal presentation. So I wanna stop here and let's open the mic up and uh, allow time for questions. Usually they happen throughout the conversation, so it takes me a little longer to get here, but we are where we are. We've got about 15 minutes left. Uh, if there's anyone left in the room, come on up. And I don't know, Chris, if you're on or not, um, but if you want to come off mute and just let me know that there's someone there. <laughs> I'm normally a patient guy. I feel like I'm in the middle of a demo and, and my server's down, so I'm waiting for the little spinny icon to stop spinning. Um, and uh, I'm trying to find ways to talk. 
There we go. I hear something. There is. Can you hear me? I can hear you great okay. now, yes. <laughs> a little loud. Okay. Um, one question I have, you know, look, is looking at all this, um, in organizations that you've worked with or what you think is maybe best practice, is doing vendor, uh, being like the vendor risk management, is that a full-time job? Are you going to like have the person doing this type of work multitask over say security awareness and a bunch of other things or should they really dedicate themselves to focusing in this space? It's, that's a great question and, and I hate to say it depends. Um, it, it does depend. Here's, here's, here's the answer, right? So look, if you manage three vendors, um, you probably don't have enough work for it to be a full-time job. However, it should definitely be a core characteristic of whoever is running that. And you know, this sort of goes against the bent of the traditional security engineer, right? What's a good vendor management skill for security side? Well, a good communicator, um, organized, uh, excited about working in Excel, right? So um, those are few and far between. Uh, so if you can find someone like that, whether or not it's a full-time position for them, you certainly want to make sure that you have the, the skills and characteristics for it. Um, at a certain point, yes, this does become a full-time job. We manage, we actively manage uh, security in my organization today for about 55 vendors and it's growing rapidly. And I do have, um, I have one person part-time and I have a, a, a one person uh, full-time on it. So I'm one of the believers that you don't have to have a lot of experience to get started in security. So we, we made a college hire. Uh, that individual is in full-time their job is to handle those questionnaire responses, get them scored appropriately, uh, learn context. And, and believe me, it, uh, Ben has exceeded my every expectation. He's at the point where he really can apply context. He's only been in, in industry for about five months. He does a great job at it. So to answer your question, maybe you might have enough work to do it full time, but more importantly, you want to have someone who does have that skill set. It's not something that you want to... Um, try to just get someone to do in their spare time. Does that, does that help answer the question? Yep. Uh, along that same line, if your vendor management team is one person, maybe two, what are some tips to maybe get by minimum viable process? Um, mm -hmm. Obviously can't meet every step of the effective vendor management. Are there sort of baselines, best practices that one can meet when working with the limited resource. Yeah, yeah, I, I think the statement was just that, um, you know, they may not be full time, they, they do need to have some level of skill, um, and, and that is for sure. Uh, and you, you wanna make sure also that you're sort of masters of that process. Many organizations have a vendor management or uh, team, and so you can partner with that team. And we did that until we got to the point where we had so many vendors and so many client contractual commitments forcing us to do deep assessment of those vendors. We actually did not have a full-time person. We partnered with a vendor management team. So they delivered and scored our questionnaires and we handled it from there. Um, but now we're, we're large enough that we have to have that individual. So, yep. I think that answered the question. Uh, as a, an additional question, um, the, so the idea of having a standardized questionnaire that you can um, effectively grade, effectively grade risk for, compare those to one another is very helpful. Um, when you look at larger cloud service providers, especially like infrastructure as of service, uh, something along the lines of like an AWS, um, it can be difficult to get them to work with your questionnaire directly. They'll often point you to like, we have a number of uh, documents that cover this, take a look at those. Um, how is your team handling those cases where the vendor doesn't want to play ball and there aren't a lot of good alternatives there in terms of someone who will complete the questionnaire for you? Great question. Let me summarize it for you just to be sure. I'm the, my, my, uh, it's hard to hear the audio, but I think what you're asking is good idea to have your own questionnaire and so forth, but a lot of times you play with 
vendors that are so large that they're not willing to answer your questionnaire and they sort of dump a bunch of documents your way. Exactly. Um, and what do you do with that? So I'm in a unique position. So normally I don't use authority to get anything. I, I like to use influence. Um, but in this case, I have to use the authority of I, you, I'm, I'm evaluating you to process information on behalf of my customers. Um, I need you to attest to your security. I cannot do it for you. I will not take that risk on. Um, so I, I appreciate all of the documentation you've pro pro provided me with, but I still need you to go and answer those questions. I also work with a business relationship owner and you know, again, if you're building that relationship with the, with the bro, you're helping them understand this is your risk. And, and so, you know, if, if you read their documentation and, and you say, oh, looks good to me, you're accepting that risk. You're the one who's interpreting their, their, um, their workflow and their security, not them. And that's on you if you, if you interpret that falsely. Now, look, there are some organizations that just refuse to play. Amazon, actually, in, in healthcare, Amazon's a little bit more willing to play with you and to answer questions for you. But there are a lot of organizations where, and verticals where they won't do that. And they just say, hey, FedRAMP, HIPAA, high trust, SOC 2, SOC 1, whatever, you know, take us or leave us. Uh, and that is a, that's another risk-based decision. And you put that on your risk register and you decide. You know, with Amazon, I'm a little less concerned about it because their practices are pretty well established and well known. They have a good reputation. I would be willing to go to my risk committee as long as it wasn't HIPAA related and say, Amazon refuses to answer our questionnaire, but I think we can do business with them anyhow. Um, if it was, you know, Billy Joe Bob's software emporium, no, nah, I don't think I'd move forward until I had more answers from them. So, good question. Other questions? I'm still up here. I have a follow up. Um, Mm -hmm. There is more uh, discussion on fourth parties. Uh, so not only looking at what data your um, third parties are directly processing, but what information they're also passing off to another party to process. Um, is that just covered? Are, are you currently uh, covering that as part of like a questionnaire looking at their third party review program? Do you have any recommendations there that you can make? Let me see if I got the question. I understood it correctly. I think you're asking me, my vendors may also engage other vendors, and am I doing some sort of uh, due diligence to assess that fourth party? Is that correct? Exactly. OK. Yeah, good. <laughs> oh, man, that's a fun one. That is a good question. So um, the way I manage that is the way my customers manage it with me. So when, when we go into contracting, um, we do have a business associate agreement and a vendor security requirements agreement. And in the VSRA, I specifically uh, pass on the requirement that my vendor must put their vendors under a uh, materially equivalent security program and uh, assessment process as I have put them. And I use that language very carefully, particularly because, you know, let's say I have 10 customers I get 10 different questionnaires and I get 10 different unique requirements, one from each customer. And they all want me to flow their entire questionnaire down. So when I'm contracting upstream with my customers, I'm very specific and I, I work very hard to ensure materially equivalent program is in the contract as opposed to what my contracts, what they typically come to me as, which is you're going to do the very same thing to your customers that I'm doing to you. Um, so that's step number one. Step number two is, um, you know, I do ask them very explicitly, you know, what amount of services are you going to be sharing out? Enumerate for me your vendors that you'll be working with and what data you'll be sharing with them. And then if there's any red flag for me there, like, oh, 100% of your data, we're going to pass on to this other person, then I'll work with my legal department and we'll talk about whether or not we actually need to contract with that downstream uh, partner or um, so good question. You have to be aware of what your vendor is going to do with your data, who they're going to share it with, and what requirements they're going to have. Did I answer your question? It did. Thank you. You bet. Other questions?
This would be so much easier if we could look each other in the eyes, and I apologize for that. Um, but uh, please come on up if you have a question, ask it. Um, don't, don't be afraid. I know we're all tired of Zoom, but let's just pretend it's not Zoom. Okay, not hearing any. Um, I'm walking, I'm walking. I do have my. Can you oh, hear me now? Here we go. Yep, go for it. Okay, sorry, I'm just a slow walker. Um, I'm trying to figure out how to deal with a, a sort of a built in vendor risk uh, for one of my systems. They require admin access in order to make changes to a number of documents and signature pages because it requires access to code, actually changing a JSP file, which then we push to prod. Um, how, how do you disentangle a vendor who has some sort of required admin access to provide support yeah. in a peripheral way? They're not providing core support, they're providing sort of periphery support for specific items. That's a great question. So I'm, I'm probably not going to answer it the first time because I'm going to be very general the first time and then I'll try to answer it specifically. And this is a whole part of this presentation that I really wanted to do, but knew there wasn't time. It's one thing to get a risk score based on their responses to your questions. It's a whole other thing to apply that risk score in context, right? So, um, you know, I may have a, two vendors that risk score a 42. Um, one of those vendors is providing, uh, I don't know, changing the light bulbs in the building. The other vendor is managing an outsourced service for me. So the 42 score for the second vendor is actually way more important to me. So I think your question was, what if you have a vendor that has like admin access to your system because they have to be able to change files? How would you manage that risk differently than, than uh, others? Is that correct? Did I get that right? Sorry, I didn't hear. Did, did I get that? Did I categorize that risk correctly? Yes. Okay, great, good. Yeah, so I, number one, I actually use a multiplier on all of my, my vendors. Once I'm done with my, I do this on a quarterly basis. Once I have their risk scores up to date that quarter, I then take a multiplier. I use, for my multiplier, and this will differ for anyone, but for my multipliers, I use whether or not they're processing uh, uh, protected information, HIPAA data for us mostly, although there's some PII, uh, whether or not they have administrative access to my data. In other words, am I pushing my data to their environment or are they reading it selectively from my environment? Um, whether or not they have had a third party security assessment performed um, and a few other things. I finally, I take away points on their risk score if they are high trust certified. Um, so I, you know, if you're in my industry, you're high trust certified, I'm going to knock your risk score down a little bit. So I use that kind of thing at a, at, a, at a global level. Now at a macro level, what else do I do? Before we engage with any vendor, we work with the business relationship owner and with the vendor management team to ensure that our questionnaires are completed. By the way, we have several. Um, we right size our questioning. So we do a very quick intake questionnaire. You know, are you going to do cloud? Are, what data will you have? Are you going to take it to the cloud? Did you write custom code for us? Is it going to be run on a mobile app? Based on their answers, we give them individual questionnaires for each one of those categories. Um, so I take all of that information, all of the risks. We work with the vendor to make sure we understood their questions. Nothing's worse than raising a red flag about something and the vendor saying, oh, no, I have that control. What are you talking about? I then write up a risk assessment. Actually, I, I used to do it, but now my team does it. They write up a risk assessment on the vendor and they make a recommendation. And in that risk assessment, that's where we're going to catch that more um, qualitative data, right? Oh, look, we've got these five risks, but you need to understand the context. These five risks are in an environment where that vendor can change our code, where that vendor can access our development environment, where that vendor holds our data for us. With that context, we make a recommendation. And in many cases, we amplify the need to remediate certain risks. Um, and I said that, you know, I used to do that. Um, we used to run all of that risk management through our CTO. 
Um, now a lot of it runs through me and I, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm making those decisions as well in context. Um, so uh, does, that, does that help? I know that's very qualitative, not very quantitative. So as an engineer, we're, we're like, I, just give me a number. Um, but for me, this is a qualitative part of the business. Once you have all your risk assessed and you know what you're looking at, you have to make a business decision in context. Uh, if that answered your question, let me know. And otherwise, we can look for some other questions as yeah. well. Uh, thank you. And uh, we're about two minutes away from the next presentation. So oh. thank you. Great. All right. Thank you, everyone, for your time. I appreciate it. Again, wish I could be there with you. Um, let's look forward to next year, right? <laughs>